everybody. My name is Tim, and I want to welcome you to Bethel today. Thanks for spending part of your day with us here. Church, this coming week is Holy Week. Holy Week begins today on Palm Sunday and ends with Easter Sunday. This week leads us through the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion and death on the cross and his resurrection three days later. Each day of Holy Week allows us to see the heart of our Savior as his love for us is shown in every step he takes toward the cross. We have several opportunities this week here at Bethel to recall Jesus' last days and to worship him. First, you're invited back on Thursday at 6 p.m. to the Maundy Thursday Experience at both Battle Lake and Fergus Falls campuses. Maundy Thursday is where we remember the Last Supper when Jesus and his disciples ate one final meal and shared in communion together. Jesus washed their feet. Later that night, Jesus was betrayed by Judas and then arrested. So as we gather on Thursday, we will eat a meal together around tables. We will sing, pray, hear God's word, and have communion together. We will worship Jesus as God's love is shown. Then comes Good Friday. Jesus came to earth to save humanity by dying on the cross on Good Friday. He endured the suffering and death so that our sins could be forgiven. He died to make the way for you and for me to be saved. So join us on Friday at our Fergus Falls campus at 7 p.m. for a Good Friday worship service. We will hear the story of the cross, of Jesus' suffering and sacrifice. We will worship him as God's love is shown. Then, three days later, we gather to celebrate the joy of Jesus' resurrection. Jesus endured and defeated death. He went to hell and back. He swung open the gates of heaven, rose again, and made a way for our sin to be forgiven. He endured the cross out of his great love for us. So on Easter Sunday, would you join us as we gather to praise and worship him? Because through the cross, God's love is shown. So today we begin Holy Week by lifting up Jesus as King. It's Palm Sunday. This is when we remember Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem, where he was greeted by crowds of people. They shouted, Hosanna. They waved palm branches and spread their coats on the ground. They called him King and welcomed him. Here, we are gathered to do the same. We will sing Hosanna, we will praise him and seek to follow him, even while knowing that it's because of us, because of our sin, that he must go to that cross on Friday. So let's worship our King, our Savior. We're in need of him, of his love and his amazing grace. He is present in the deepest valley or on the highest mountain. He always has been, always is, and always will be. In him, God's love is shown. Here is Jesus. So greetings uh, to those of you joining us today, whether you're joining us online or at Bethel Battle Lake, uh, welcome to you. Um, as, as we start today, here's what, I, here's what I want you to do. I want you to picture Jesus. I want you to picture Jesus. Can, can you see him? I want you to picture Jesus about to enter onto the battlefield. He, he rode onto the battlefield, not on a stallion, but on a donkey. Can you, can you see him? Can you see him? Uh, the, the battle is about to heat up for him. The crowd waved palm branches, cheering him on, a festive but fleeting start to what would become a brutal conflict, complete, complete with traitors and turncoats. The battle would be bloody, the battle would be deadly. It would seem to most observers that Jesus had lost, but in the end, he was victorious. It would seem to most that the battle was only physical, but in the end, it was also spiritual. I want you to picture Jesus. Can you see him? The battle is about to heat up for Jesus on Palm Sunday. And today, the battle that Jesus has already won rages on in us. The devil, mortally wounded, still schemes and he still struggles. And so Jesus prepares us for spiritual warfare by telling us that you need to know your enemy, you need to know your strength, and you need to know your weapons. We're going to look today at Ephesians chapter 6, and uh, this is kind of the last section that we're in in this book in our journey in Christ where divisions die, this series we began last September. 
Church, here we are. Here we are wrapping up today. Ephesians chapter 6. Maybe grab a Bible if you would. And as you have one, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse, I'll start at verse 10. We read there, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the, the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In, in addition to this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flames the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the the helmet of salvation and and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, Words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. In chains, Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will, will tell you everything so that you may also know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, thank you for these words that you gave to us through the Apostle Paul. Through these words, build your kingdom, strengthen your church, prepare us for battle, and deliver to us the victory of Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Have a seat. So, uh, listen, spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare, is it just sort of overblown? No, it's real. Life is a battlefield, And there is a dark force at work in the world that hates you. It hates you. There's a force at work in this world that does not want you to believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a force at work in this world that does not want you to share the message of the cross with the people around you or in the communities in which we live. There's a force at work in this world that does not want you to live for Jesus. There's a force at work in this world that does not want you to reflect the love and the mercy of God to the people who are around you here in church today or online, wherever you are, right? See, there's a force at work in this world, and you may not have picked a fight, Christian, with this force, but it doesn't matter if you pick the fight. You're in it. I mean, you're in the fight. It's going on. It's raging all around you. You feel it? You sense it? Mel Gibson had just finished the film, The Passion of the Christ, and he was asked whether he believes in spiritual warfare. Here's what he said in response. That's the big picture, isn't it? Gibson replied. The big realms are slugging it out. We're just the meat in the sandwich. And for some reason, we're worth it. I don't know why, but we are. Wow. So, What is spiritual warfare? Uh, Spiritual warfare is real, okay? And it is a lot less mysterious than we make it out to seem. 
See, for some of us, we're, you know, particularly the older you are, you're thinking, yeah, it's spiritual warfare. I, I'll know when I see it. By golly, it's pretty clear. When you see somebody's head spinning and vomit, green vomit coming out the mouth, that's when you know you're engaged in the battle. It is much more subtle than the exorcist makes it seem. Spiritual battle looks like this. Every time you're presented with the opportunity to entertain in your mind a lustful thought, you're in the battle. You're in the war. Every time you have the chance to do something vindictive towards someone, you're on the battlefield. Every time you have the chance to say something harsh and hurtful, you are in the midst of the battle. Every time you toy with the notion that you're just a little bit better than most of the other people around you, then you can just be sure that you're under attack, surrounded by enemy fire. That's what it looks like. It looks like everyday life. And so Jesus prepares us for spiritual warfare in everyday life, telling us to know your enemy, to know your strength, and to know your weapons. So let's, let's dive in. He says to know your enemy. Paul says that our struggle, our wrestling, which is up close and personal, it's not just a war, you're flinging arrows to far distances, it's, it's right there, it's a wrestling, it's a struggling, is not with one another, but it's with Satan, it's, it's with the devil, Paul doesn't say to armor up. He doesn't say so that you can take your stand against your kids or against your spouse. You know, armor up, church, so that you can take your stand against your spouse, so that you can take your stand against your boss, right? So that you can take your, armor up, church, and so that you can take your stand against the Democrats or against the Republicans or whoever, right? They're not the enemy. They're not the enemy, You might think they are, but they are not the enemy. The enemy is not the bank. The enemy is not, you know, the business across town that's making it difficult for you to be profitable. Or Amazon. They're not the enemy. Paul says, armor up, verse 12, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Listen, church, the people around you today, look around you, look around you. Look around you. Battle like look around you. See the people you're sitting with? They're not the enemy. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are not the enemy. Your naughty kids are not the enemy. Your irritating spouse is not the enemy. The politician in office whose policies are driving you crazy is not the enemy. And so when we feel attacked and then we, we blame each other or we blame God, Satan and, demon, Satan and his demons, they laugh and they run away, pushing each other into the bushes like a bunch of teenage pranksters who just got away with something. So don't let them. Don't let them. Satan is our enemy. So let's stay together, church. Jesus prayed that we would. He said in John chapter 17, may they be brought to complete unity. Jesus prayed for his church to be together, to be united. And he said that if we are, the gates of hell will not overcome his church if we're together. I wonder if some of you remember the movie Gladiator. Remember the movie Gladiator? Yeah, there it is. Uh, with Maximus, played by Russell Crowe. Um, he, he organizes this band of slaves who are sent to the Colosseum to face uh, elite warriors, right? And um, all these gladiators, they're, they're all foot soldiers, right? They're marched down this dark passageway into the Colosseum, onto the Colosseum floor. And as they reach the Colosseum floor, they hear the, the cry of bloodlust from the crowd. Oh, it's scary. It's a powerful scene in the movie. They have no idea what they're going to face. They have no idea what they're going to face. So they're, they're mostly untrained and they're absolutely outmatched. And so Maximus, a soldier, Maximus, a general, their leader, says to the men, stay together. Guys, we got to stay together. We got to stay close to survive. You remember the scene? He assembles them in this, this tight circle in the center of the arena, back to back, shield to shield, shields aloft, spears upward, Right? They're waiting for the gates to open, releasing the hellish terror that is caged behind them. And Maximus basically says to the guys, whatever comes out of that gate, stay together. Church, same for us. Same for you and me. We have got to stay together 
in this fight. The fight is not with one another, but the enemy of our soul, the devil himself. The second thing we need to know is not only do we need to know our enemy, we need to know our strength. Uh, here again, we touched on this last week, but, but we don't fight in our own strength. We fight in the strength of the Lord. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand. Now, Satan is powerful. And you might not feel particularly powerful. Do you feel powerful? Anybody here feel powerful? Powerful people? Yeah, I'm ready, because look at me. You know, I've been working out. Whatever, you know. You're actually not that tough. If you go out fighting in your own strength, I have no hope for you. But you have something better. You have the strength of the Lord. You've got God. You've got the name of Jesus, which makes the devil and the demons run for the hills. That's what you've got. Take that strength into this battle. James 4 says, Submit yourselves then to God, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Okay, so so what Satan wants is for you to think that he is really tough. Or for for you to think that you're really tough, right? Because then you'll go in your strength. But Satan wants you to think that he's really tough. He has, it's part of his scheme. Part of his scheme is to think, make you think things are not true about him. It's, it's psyops. It's a psyops war in your mind. Okay? Satan wants you to think that he's stronger than he actually is. So a guy by the name of Tim Downs wrote a book called Head Game. Head Game. And in the book, he writes this. Fascinating. Fascinating. He writes this. Psyops stands for psychological operations, a form of warfare as old as the art of war itself. An example of this can be found in the battle strategies of Alexander the Great. On one occasion, his army, that is Alexander the Great's army, was in full retreat from a larger enemy. So he gave orders to his armorers to construct oversized breastplates and helmets that would fit men seven to eight feet tall. And as his army would retreat, he would leave these items for the pursuing army to discover. And when the enemy would find the oversized gear, they were demoralized by the thought of fighting such giant soldiers, and they would abandon their pursuit. (laughs) Clever, clever church. Satan is playing head games with you. He is not that tough. He is not stronger than the name of Jesus, which can be on your lips. He is not stronger than the Lord and his strength, which is in you. Don't be fooled. Be strong in the Lord, knowing that, as it says in 1 John 4, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Last thing God wants you to know for the battle is this. Not only do you need to know the enemy, not only do you need to know your strength, you need to know your weapons. And here in Ephesians 6, God uses Paul to tell us not only uh, the intel that we need on the enemy, uh, not only the might that we need, which exceeds that of our enemy, but also the armor that we need to defeat him. So intel, might, and armor are given to us. And today, I'm just going to touch on this. I'm going to talk about the armor of God as it's given to us here. But here's what I want you to know. After Easter, we're going to start a series called Armor Up. And it's going to be all about the armor of God that he gives us. And we're going to talk about this passage more fully. But just I want to run through it here today. Paul describes both defensive and offensive weapons that help us to stand firm. Notice it with me. Verse 14 and following. It says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Notice what God has provided for us. Not only does does he give us intel on the enemy, not only does he give us the might that we need, but he gives us the army that we need to fight him and to win. He gives us the belt of truth. A soldier's belt did basically two things. 
uh, it protected his midsection, and it gave him freedom of movement. I don't know if it held up his pants too. It might have done that. Three things then maybe. Okay. But it gave him all of that. Living according to the truth does the same for us. Protects us and gives us freedom of movement as we have the truth. Secondly, notice the breastplate of righteousness. A, a breastplate would be simply like a bulletproof vest. It'd be like a bulletproof vest going to the battle with a bulletproof vest. It protects your most vital organs. And the only bulletproof righteousness is Jesus' righteousness. And if you are in Christ, then that's the, that's the righteousness you have. Not your own, but one given to you by him. Not only that, but, but the shoes of gospel peace. He, he says, feet fitted with the readiness that comes. Feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Listen, the only thing that Satan hates more than the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, that people can be forgiven of their sins and put right with God, the only thing he hates more than the gospel is when Christians run near and far telling other people they can be at peace with God too. He hates that. We are to be Christians fitted with a readiness to go to the communities where we live and around the world. We talk about reaching the people of Fergus Falls, Battle Lake, and Budamasa. We talk about making room everywhere we want to, by God's grace, make a difference. We need to be ready to bring the gospel of peace to our community. And we need to have the shield of faith, okay? The shield of faith. What is that? It's the, it's the shield that protects us from the, the enemy's arrows that he's shooting constantly at us. Arrows of doubt and division, persecution, rejection, and guilt. Armor up, church. Take up the shield of faith. And the helmet of salvation. Think about this. Wearing a helmet of salvation means keeping in mind and thinking about and meditating upon all that God has done for us in Jesus and the future that he has in mind for us for all eternity. The helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, is fatal for Satan. It's the very same weapon that Jesus used in the wilderness, and we get to use it too. The Word of God. Satan doesn't stand a chance against the Word of God. But now, <laughs> and finally, as if to encourage us with one final weapon, which is over, under, behind, and in all of these weapons, he tells us that the risen king is always ready to hear you when you call out to him, that you have a hotline to heaven. <laughs> he said, perhaps, perhaps our greatest weapon is prayer. Paul writes this in verse 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, and be alert, and always keep on praying for all the saints. Okay, Paul's strategy for prayer is really kind of simple. Pray for everybody all the time. Well, what kind of prayers? Any kind of prayer. All kinds of prayers. For who? For everybody. For anybody. Just pray. <laughs> this, is, this is his strategy. Just get out there and pray. Talk to the Lord. And while you're at it, he says, while you're at it, pray for me, Paul says. Why? Why does, why does Paul want the Ephesians to pray for him? So that things wouldn't be so hard for him in the prison from which he's writing, you know, this Roman prison from which he's writing to the church in Ephesus? He says, just pray that it'd be a little bit easier for me. My bed would be more, more comfortable, that the soldier would be nicer with their words and not so mean sometimes. No, that's not what he's asking prayer for. What is he asking prayer for? That he, wouldn't, that he wouldn't accidentally say the name of Jesus and get himself in even more trouble than he's already in? No. What does he want him to pray for? Listen, verse 19 and 20. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Man, I love this guy. Don't you love this guy? He's like, I know, he's like, Paul's like, he asked them to pray that he would have even more boldness to share the message that wound him up in prison in the first place. I love that. I love this guy. Pray that I would declare fearlessly as I should. Why? Because he's all armored up. Because he is all 
armored up, just as he encourages the church and us to be prepared to stand firm. Mm. Church, here's what we need to do. We need to picture Jesus. See, this all comes right back to him. Because we think that we're the mighty warrior that's going to win the battle. And, and if that's your thinking, yes, you are, you are one of his soldiers and you're in it together with all your brothers and sisters in Christ. But you're not the soldier, you're not the warrior everybody should be excited about. There is a warrior we can be excited about, however. I want you to picture Jesus. Can you picture him? The battle is about to heat up for Jesus. He rode out onto the battlefield, not on a stallion, but on a donkey. Can you see him? You see Jesus? The crowd waved their palm branches, cheering him on. The battle would be bloody. The battle would be deadly. It would seem to most people that Jesus had lost, but in the end, he was victorious. Jesus is the victorious warrior. And as my life and as your life is in Christ, as your identity is in him, having his righteousness, having his victory, then you have everything that you need. His victory is now yours. Oh, that's a game changer. It's a game changer for the church. As my life is found in Christ, I have everything that I need. Let, let me close with this uh, quote. It's actually a quote from a man who knew what it meant to be in the battle. A brother in the Lord who knew what it meant to be in the battle. It, it was a man by the name of Watchman Nee. Have you heard that name before? Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee became a Christian in mainland China in 1920. So 102 years ago, right? Became a Christian in mainland China at the age of 17. Later, he was imprisoned for his faith. He remained in prison until his death in 1972. I want you to hear what Watchman Nee had to say. Here's what he wrote. Outside of Christ, I am only a sinner. But in Christ, I am saved. Out of Christ, I am empty. In Christ, I am full. Out of Christ, I am weak. In Christ, I am strong. Out of Christ, I cannot. In Christ, I am more than able. Outside of Christ, I have been defeated. In Christ, I am already victorious. How meaningful are the words in Christ? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, uh, for chapter after chapter in this book, you have been driving home to us the, the privilege of seeing ourselves as people whose identity is found in Christ. To have an identity that, that we did not earn, but that you earned. An identity that uh, bears your name and not our own. Thank you. An identity with a righteousness that you earned that we could not. Thank you. Help each one of us, Lord, I pray, today to be found in Christ. And if we are in Christ, we are full, we are strong, we are saved, we are more than able, and we are already victorious. Praise God. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. So now, church, hear these words of blessing over you. These are the last words uh, of Paul to the church in Ephesus, and I want to say them over you today. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. God's peace to you all.